St. John Ogilvy, who was born at Keith in 1579 and executed in Glasgow in 1615. This is a, a remarkable story of a remarkable man from Keith who has a privileged place in the history of the Roman Catholic Church, particularly in Scotland and here in the North East. St. John Ogilvy's life was short, and yet his tale of bravery, courage, selflessness, and devotion to his faith has lasted long after his death, almost 400 years ago. A Jesuit priest, he was martyred in Glasgow for refusing to denounce Catholicism and accepting that the King, James VI of Scotland and the I of England, had supreme authority in all matters spiritual as well as civil. Ogilvy was no traitor to his nation. He declared his loyalty to his king on countless occasions, but made clear he was dying for religion alone, adding, for that I am prepared to give even a hundred lives. John Ogilvy was not born a Catholic. He wasn't admitted to the faith until he was 17 years of age. He was a priest for only five years and was dead by the age of 36. His trial, following unspeakable torture, beatings, starvation and sleep deprivation, and his subsequent execution became a cause célèbre throughout Europe and he was revered by his Jesuit order and throughout the church. But it was not until 1929 that he was beatified, made blessed, and 1976 that he was canonised as Scotland's first saint in more than 700 years. So how did this young man from Keith come to earn his place among the great and mighty of the Catholic Church? Here is his remarkable story. The early years. John was born into a well-connected family in 1579, the son of Walter Ogilvy, Baron of Drumlock Heath, whose father James had been treasurer to Mary Queen of Scots. The family tree is said to have stretched back to William, King of Scotland, and Queen Margaret, herself later to be made a saint. Like many, the Ogilvies were once staunch Catholics but the Reformation of 1560 had changed the face of Scotland. Just 20 years before John Ogilvy's birth, John Knox had succeeded in switching Scotland's state religion from Catholicism to Calvinism, later known as Presbyterianism, and there were fierce purges to stamp out the Catholic faith. The saying of Mass was outlawed, priests were banished, Anyone suspected of being a papist could be thrown into prison. Even being found with a rosary or crucifix would lead to punishment. And yet, brave souls were still prepared to risk danger, imprisonment and death to practice their faith in secret. Although some of the nobility, particularly in the northern part of the country, may have retained Catholic leanings, few were willing to show them for fear of losing their lands, their wealth, their status. So young Ogilvy was brought up a Calvinist. Such was the fear of the influence from still Catholic Europe that permits had to be granted for travelling abroad, and Walter Ogilvy, Ogilvy obtained one for his son, who set off from home in 1592, aged 13, to further his education and his experience of life so he would be better equipped to play what his father hoped would be a prominent role in Scottish affairs for his firstborn. But the path of life that John was to take was not the one that his family had planned. He travelled widely and studied in France, Germany and Italy, and listened to scholars both Calvinist and Catholic discussing religion. That proved a source of inspiration and at the age of 17 he converted to Catholicism. It was the first of many brave moves. We can only imagine the torment this must have caused. How had, the, how had he broken the news to his family? It must have caused him great anguish and led all, to all financial support to him being cut off. It is thought he never saw them again. Return to the old man. Accompanied by fellow Jesuit, Father James Moffat, and by Friar John Campbell, a Capuchin, Father John Ogilvy set off in 1613 for Scotland, travelling under an assumed name of John Watson. The government had spies scattered over the continent, whose business was to pick up, in Rome, 
Valladolid and other places information about priests and seminarians destined for home missions. The information was forwarded to those who would search ships hailing from foreign ports and, sus and suspects were apprehended on landing in Scotland and England. As Watson, the Scottish surname meaning son of water, in the guise of a soldier returning from European wars, looked to turn to horse dealing. He split up from his companions on landing and headed for his native northeast, where the Catholic faith was still flickering under the protection of the powerful governor, Earl of Hundley. His superiors may have felt he would be safest here. He was close to home, but there is no record of him having any contact with his family. Father John is thought to have spent Christmas at Stuffbogie, and may even visit Grant in Ballandalich, who was fined around this time for harbouring a priest. Most noblemen wanted little to do with a visitor. Going against the king would cost him a position and land holdings. They pretended to be faithful to their new religion so that to retain their wealth. However, others of professional or lower classes responded. He headed for Edinburgh after Christmas and not long after set out for London or something of a mission of a mystery mission. One version is that he, sent, he went to see King James himself. He tells nothing about the purpose of his journey, but is so impressed the king gave him the Father Ogilvy a safe conduct to France in order to further the scheme. The king's constant preoccupation was earning the loyalty of his Catholic subjects, and he would dearly have wished to have the Pope accept him as a Protestant king. Perhaps he saw Father Ogilvy as a vehicle for achieving this, but the priest's inability to deliver an insurance of loyalty had the effect later of making the king more unrelenting towards him. From France, Father Ogilvy returned to Scotland in June 1614 to continue his convert missionary work, mainly around Edinburgh, Glasgow and Renfrewshire. He said he went up and penetrated Edinburgh Castle to comfort prisoners. During his mission in Scotland, John Ogilvy wrote to Father Claude Alcaviva, General of the Jesuits, since July 1614. The harvest here is very great. The labourers here are very few. One of them, Father Andrew Crichton, the bearer of this letter, long in chains for the faith, is leaving the country so as not to fall again into the hands of the enemy, since he is, on account of his father's captivity, too easily recognised. He would expose to danger the noblemen who would have often to turn and took him with great trepidation into their houses and hid him. In my own country I am not known to anybody and am engaged day and night in more work than I can cope with in any day. I, thanks be to God, do whatever I wish freely during the day in the open streets and by night, free of all suspicion, I go out my duties or my vocation. But the net was closing on on Father John. He travelled to Glasgow to reconcile five men to the church, but one was a spy, Adam Boyd, who had contacted the Protestant Archbishop of Glasgow, John Spottiswood, an appointee of the king, and a trap was set. On October 14, 1614, Father John was arrested, imprisoned in the Archbishop's palace, and appeared before the Borough Court of Glasgow. John Ogilvy's nightmare was about to begin. The Path to Priesthood In 1596, John Ogilvy was registered as a student at the Scots College of Douai in France, which had been moved at the time to Louvain in Belgium. The college occasionally received students who were not Catholics, and among his instructors was Cornelius A. Lapide, then a young professor of scripture and later to become a great scholar. Poverty at the college meant that some students had to be dispersed, and in 1598 Ogilvy was at the Jesuit College at Olmutz in Bohemia, supported by a papal bursary, and it is here that he became a Catholic. Having embraced the faith, John Ogilvy wanted to become a priest. The Jesuit order was close to his heart, and he traversed the continent to achieve his aim. His application, along with others, was deferred because of plague, but he persisted and in 1599 was admitted to the Jesuit order at Brunn in Moravia. From there he was sent to Graz in the Austrian Tyrol, 
where he made his first vows in 1601 and stayed there until 1606, teaching grammar in the lower school and studying philosophy at the university. He spent a time teaching in Vienna, then returned to Olmutz for more studies. In 1609, though not yet ordained, he was appointed, along with another young Scot, Father Green, to the charge of encouraging devotion to Our Lady as a means of fortifying a faith that was under siege. He achieved success, and the Jesuit historian would later recount one Lenten exercise which saw Ogilvy lead young pupils, after 5 a.m. Mass and Communion, in making a way of the cross through the streets of the unfriendly city, carrying crosses and dressed in sacking, returning to the chapel to set their crosses before the altar and lie prostrate in prayer for an hour. In 1610 he was sent back to Paris and ordained as a priest at the age of 31. His prayer had been answered. The newly ordained Father Ogilvy was appointed confessor to the students at Rouen, where he met priests exiled from Scotland for saying Mass or ministering to people and realising the heavy burden of Catholics in his native land. He longed to return there. He applied to his Jesuit superiors for, for permission to go home. Twice this was refused, but his persistence eventually paid off. There was then no other Jesuit priest in Scotland, almost no priest at all, so this represented an extraordinary vote of confidence in this inexperienced priest. It was a dangerous mission. Doctor in trial, for five months after his arrest, Father John was subjected to starvation, beatings, torture and sleep deprivation, but he met it all with equanimity, humour and courage. He even engaged in religious arguments with ministers. He was moved to Edinburgh for further investigation by the Privy Council of the King and was ordered to be subjected to the torture of the vigil or waking, which has been designed to ensure confessions of witchcraft. The prisoner was kept awake by being punched, thrown to the floor and pierced by sharp instruments or witches' bridles. This went on for eight days and nine nights until a doctor pronounced that he was within hours of death. Through all this he had refused to disclose the names of Catholics to whom he had been ministering. After a few hours rest he was brought back in front of the judges, still resisting threats and promises to save his skin. He was taken by horseback to Glasgow, where for weeks he was shackled to a heavy iron, unable to sit up without help. In a letter smuggled out of the prison, he wrote, I lie burdened with an iron weight of 200 pounds, awaiting death, unless I accept what is offered with the king's clemency, that is, a rich provostry and abjure the faith. Having been tortured once by a vigil of nine nights and eight days, I now await a second torture and afterwards death. The jailer will be coming back. Banishment for saying mass, like others, was no longer an option. The Ogilvy case had now gone further and the king wanted him to repudiate the Pope or die. King James intervened directly to draft a list of five questions, all designed to force the priest into accepting or rejecting the divine right of the king in all matters, spiritual and temporal. Father Ogilvy was finally put on trial for treason on March 10, 1615, at the toll booth in Glasgow Square. Facing the charges, he declared that he would die in defence of the king's civil authority, but he could not obey him on spiritual matters. Two hours after the trial began, the jury found him guilty and he was condemned to be hanged and quartered that afternoon. Father Ogilvy spent three hours in prayer while the judges and jury went to lunch. Then the sheriff came to escort him to the public square for execution. Holding the rosary, the Jesuit mounted the scaffold and prayed briefly. A last-minute reprieve of his life and the promise of a substantial sum of money was refused. He declared his loyalty to the king and made it clear that he was dying for religion alone, adding... For that I am prepared to give even a hundred lives. Father Ogilvy threw his rosary into the crowd. It struck a Hungarian merchant visiting the city and became the instrument of his conversion. The hangman tied the priest's hands, led him up the ladder and pushed him off. 
He did not die immediately, so the executioner grabbed his legs and pulled him down to end his agony. The crowd murmured against the injustice of the execution, and, indeed, and instead of the body being quartered, it was spirited away to be buried secretly in a criminal's plot in the outskirts of Glasgow. Path to Sainthood In the years after his death, Father John Ogilvy was revered as a martyr throughout Europe, wherever his story was told. The scripture scholar Cornelius Alapide, who had known Ogilvy at Jesuit College, wrote, It is clear from the account of his martyrdom that he astonished the Calvinists, for although unconquered by torture and still bold and ready in debate, he opened not his mouth against his tormentors. In a testimony in 1629 to Catholic Church authorities who were considering whether John Ogilvy had died a martyr, William Sinclair, an Edinburgh lawyer who had been banished, wrote of what he had heard from fellow prisoners and others who had witnessed the execution. I know for certain that he persevered in his Catholic faith up to the last moment of his life in a devout, pious and steadfast manner. On the night before his death, he devoted all the time that he possibly could to prayer and spiritual meditation. And they further add that he did the same before ascending the steps themselves, calling both God and his fellow men to witness that he died in the Roman Catholic faith. His piety and also his constancy were proved by his readiness to forgive all those who had trespassed against him, just as he prayed to God to forgive him, and by embracing and kissing the scaffold, and finally bidding the hangman to be of good heart, and by pardoning him also. It is impossible that he did not die as a martyr. Following the Reformation, the Catholic Church had almost died out, but it stayed alive in corners of Scotland, not least in parts of the North East, and especially in John Ogilvy's homeland of Banffshire. At Scallon in Glenlivet, a seminary operated from 1716 to 32, producing priests who headed out to all parts of the country to minister in secret. These brave men were following in the footsteps of the likes of Ogilvy. Scallon had been attacked and burned by government troops, but the staff and students returned from hiding to rebuild and prepare to set out to keep our faith alive. In the latter half of the 1700s, the penal laws were relaxed, and in 1793 they were largely abolished, allowing Catholics once again to practice their religion openly and free from fear. The cause of motors, martyrs such as John Ogilvy lay dormant for many years until revived at the close of the 19th century and a process of investigating extensive historical evidence was opened by the Vatican, paving the way for the beatification of this man from Keith by Pope Pius XI in 1929. Nothing much happened about the next step towards him being proclaimed a saint until in the early 1960s, the cause of the English martyrs, or at least 40 of them, began to revive with the appointment of an energetic young Jesuit, Father Paolo Molinari, as Posturo General in Rome. With his investigations came the possibility of reopening the cause of Ogilvy. Scots Jesuits, Father James Quinn and Father Thomas Riley, great supporters of the Ogilvy cause, were appointed to form a national council composed of priests to investigate what devotion existed in Scotland to John Ogilvy, and armed with a consignment of 300,000 medals, the committee set about promoting prayers for his canonisation. Of course, to pave the way for sainthood, a miracle would be needed. Father Riley and Father John Fitzgibbon ran a large parish in Glasgow's Easter House dedicated to Blessed John Ogilvy, and in their congregation was a docker called John Fagan, who in 1965 was diagnosed as having stomach cancer. An operation removed part of his stomach, but from x-rays afterwards, doctors declared that they had done all they could. The cancer cells remained, and they said, 
the tumour would return, which it did seven months later. It was decided that surgery would kill him. His wife Mary was told, there is nothing more we can do for your husband. Take him home and be good to him. His GP noted how the mass in his patient's abdomen was growing ever bigger. Mr Fagan was in continuous pain. In January 1967, Father Fitzgibbon administered the last rites and he gave a medal of Blessed John Ogilvy to Mrs Fagan suggesting she pin it to her husband's pyjamas. Parishioners prayed to Blessed John for him. In March, John Fagan was said to be hours away from death, and the GP declared there was nothing more he would do. He expected to return the next day to sign the death certificate. The Legion of Mary and neighbours joined the Fagan family at the bedside to pray. After they had gone, Mrs Fagan kept a quiet vigil as John slipped in and out of consciousness. At six in the morning she woke and felt the room cold. She checked her husband's pulse and heartbeat and there was neither. She slumped in her chair, head in her hands and dozed off. She was woken by a voice declaring, Mary, I am hungry. It took five years of intensive medical investigations checking of all hospital medical records and examinations by the church in Scotland and in Rome before it was officially confirmed that there was no natural explanation for John Fagan's recovery. In October 1975, the Congregation of Cardinals in Rome accepted that a miracle had taken place and in May 1976, approval came for the blessed John Ogilvy to be made a saint. Great Day in Rome. In October 1976, 10,000 pilgrims gathered at St Peter's Basilica in Rome for the canonization of John Ogilvy. The many from Scotland included a plane load from the Diocese of Aberdeen and a contingent from St Thomas's in Keith, led by parish priest Monsignor John Copeland, a great exponent of the Ogilvy cause. Monsignor Copeland had persuaded Isla Bank Mills at Keith to make Ogilvy tartan for scarves which were proudly worn in Rome. A young student priest from Keith, Andrew Mann, travelled from the Scots College in Spain to deliver the first reading at St Peter's ceremony and a Keith parishioner, James Collins, was given the privilege of carrying a candle in offer to procession for which he received a medal from Pope Paul. Helen Ettles and Ina Shaw, parishioners of St Thomas's, recalled a great day Generations of Scots, and particularly of the parish of St Thomas and Keith, has prayed most earnestly for Blessed Joan Ogilvy to be declared a saint. At last, generations of prayer and a miracle attributed to him were accepted as scrutiny by the Vatican. John Fagan from Glasgow had been an inexplicable recovery from cancer, and doctors had given all hope for him. We were all full of joy and began to make plans for many as possible to be present, present in Rome for the ceremony of canonization. Researching to the Ogilvy Tartan revealed at least three in use. The main one was a very elaborate set of family tartans, combined into one which took almost a square yard of material. It was a most gaudy yellow, not very suitable for everyday use. But the local woolen mills agreed to make up a quantity of headscarves for us. The other two sets were more suitable for general use, and the same mill made up lengths of material on travelling rugs. We took one of these rugs up as a gift to the Pope, and of course we took some whisky as well. When the great day came, the St Thomas group set off for Aberdeen Airport, and were joined with others from the diocese. At that time, the bishop's chair in Aberdeen was vacant, we had many of the senior clergy from the city with us. We, the laity, speculated on which of them would be called to fill the vacancy. In our more thoughtful moments, we offer prayers for the one who would be eventually be laden with that responsibility. Much later, a little known priest from a parish in the very far north, his first parish, was the one chosen and became Bishop Mario Conti. Arriving in Rome, we are com our accommodation in the Hotel Michelangelo, just outside the Vatican walls, as ever, most room was full. 
are in the senior Copeland had studied at Rome Scotch College and we benefited on many occasions from his local knowledge. On the day of his canonization, we had to be in St Peter's very early. Our allotted place was very close to the altar and had a good view of the proceedings. We watched the VIPs arriving, including Mr Fagan and Princess Alexandra and her husband, Mr Angus Ogilvy. The Mass was most memorable. One of the readers was a young seminarian from Keith, Andrew Mann, who read very well and clearly, but with a touch of the accent of Keith, making us feel at home. The Pope Paul VI referred to St John as a man of Strathila, and we glowed with reflected glory. Later Jimmy Collins from Keith helped present the traditional gifts to His Holiness and received a special medal in return. We all felt we had a little share in, this, in that too. After the Mass we all gathered in the square to receive the papal blessing. Suddenly a small group emerged carrying a banner. This was a pastor Jack Glass and his banner read, Thousands of Scots object to this. The Italian police rolled up his banner and led the party so courteously to the airport and stayed to see them off. We spent the rest of the five days sightseeing, with mass each day in a different church. And another highlight was a papal audience, people were blessed especially, and with us the objects of piety we had brought as souvenirs. We left Rome emotionally overwhelmed, vowing to go back, but with memories that will last forever.